No. Rolling, please. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now do I call you Hugh? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Make it as relaxed as we right. can. We just have a good My time. My tie's straight. That's one yeah. thing I am obsessed with. Mr. President, as you know, this uh, we talk here basically about how you came into the presidency and the background and what prepared you. One of the things I noticed is that you never hungered for the White House. You entered politics without a great ambition to go right to the White House. Why? So my whole political ambition, uh, after a term or two, in the House of Representatives was to be the speaker and handle that gavel up there in front of all uh, 434 other members. You didn't get Potomac fever right off, huh? that idea that you wanted to, to go down to the White House where the big action No, is, no, huh? no. I had really never any ambition to uh, get into the executive branch, either as vice president or president. My ambition was focused 99% on trying to be Speaker of the House. You know, there is a picture in your book, um, your memoirs of being president, that shows a House session, and there you are, and Richard Nixon, and Lyndon Johnson. All three would become president. Did you have any inkling back there that any of None those people whatsoever. were on the way? None whatsoever, uh, Hugh. Uh, I first met Dick Nixon the day I was sworn in the first year, January 1949, I had just taken the oath of office along with all the other freshmen, and this man walked up to me and he said, I'm Dick Nixon from California. I welcome you here uh, uh, in the House chamber. That was January of 49. That was the start, huh? that uh, long relationship. Realistically, when you'd been in Congress for a while, did you see a chance to be speaker? Did you think there would be a political change of that nature? I must have subjectively thought that. Uh, I was very lucky. I got uh, a superb committee assignment by pure happenstance. Uh, my first year, I was first put on the Committee on Public Works. And I was the most junior member of the minority, and that's way down the line. It was the Committee on Public Works, but it fortunately had jurisdiction over the White House. And President Truman moved out of the White House because it was falling down, literally falling down. And so our committee had to pass judgment on whether it should be torn down entirely and rebuilt whether the walls on the outside should be retained and the inside gutted. So Mr. Truman had our committee down to the White House in 1950. And I, we got a personal tour. I see. And it was interesting. He pointed out how the ceiling in the East Room it was 18 inches fallen. He showed us into the bathrooms and they were ancient. Mm -hmm. He pointed out there wasn't a single built-in closet. <laughs> uh, that was my first experience in the White yeah, House. The White House yeah. Now you began to meet presidents, of course, in your congressional role. Uh, what did you think of Truman? Well, he was one of my favorites, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in foreign policy. I admired his strong action in meeting the uh, communist aggression in South Korea. I favored his uh, decision to proceed with the nuclear uh, bomb program. I applauded his action to end the war uh, in the Pacific uh, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In, and I strongly supported his Marshall Plan because it was important that uh, we uh, move ahead to rebuild Western Europe and not make the same mistake we did after World War I. What'd you think of Ike? Uh, well, I was uh, among the uh, Republicans in the House who uh, signed a letter to Ike. I think there were 20 of us. So we urged him to come back and run for president. 
and that was not very popular back in my Except Michigan <laughs> congressional district. Back with Bob Taft's they, country. Huh? That was Taft country. Yeah. I think Ike uh, did a fine job as uh, president. As a matter of fact, when I became president, a president has the prerogative of having three portraits in the cabinet room of former presidents. I picked Abraham Lincoln, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and Harry Truman. I see, you had a Democrat right in there. Yeah. How about, how about your feeling about Kennedy? Now, did you know him in the House or if, when he was in the Senate? I, by pure happenstance, Hugh, I got to know Jack Kennedy very well. So when I was assigned an office, I was over in what was then called the old House office building. By luck, my office was right across the corridor from Jack Kennedy's and right next to Lloyd Benson's. So. Very often, for the next four years, I would walk back and forth to the House chamber when a vote came up with Jack Kennedy. We'd walk into the House chamber and he'd go on the Democratic side and I'd walk on the Republican side. But our friendship uh, became, I would say, very warm and very enduring. And that friendship made it very difficult when I was subsequently made a member of the Warren Commission and mm -hmm. had to um, uh, analyze the facts uh, about his assassination uh, in 1970. Tell me a little bit about that, because uh, you weren't that enthusiastic about being on the commission, were you at first? No, I was, of course, very saddened yes. about his death because of my long-standing friendship, but on a Sunday night right after the assassination, uh, I got a call from Lyndon Johnson, yes. and he said, uh, Congressman, I want to appoint you as the House member representing uh, the Republicans to investigate the assassination. But he said, I want you as the Republican. I said, Mr. President, I've got all these duties uh, on the Committee on Appropriations and so forth and so on, and well, you know Lyndon. I know. He just <laughs> twisted my arm, and I said, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, you're glad you did it, though. Oh, no, I'm, I'm very glad I did it, and mm -hmm. I feel very strongly that uh, our decisions, the two basic decisions, Hugh, number one, that Lee Harvey Oswald committed the assassination, and our committee, uh, or the Warren Commission, found no evidence of a conspiracy foreign or domestic. Mm -hmm. Now Oliver Stone and all the people that are trying to make a buck out of the tragedy, in my opinion, have not come up with any new evidence. Yeah. Yeah. They simply have distorted the facts. They have come up with, in my opinion, unsound decisions. Uh, the basic conclusions are the same. Oswald did it and there was no conspiracy. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Lyndon Johnson as a legislator and as a president? Well, as a legislator, he was about one of the best. Mm -hmm. He knew how to make coalitions. He knew how to manipulate. He knew the rules. From a legislative point of view, Lyndon Johnson was a very, very skilled uh, member of the Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, he was tough personally. Uh, he was very tough on me had some unkind statements, but basically uh, he was a good, decent, tough guy. I'll never forget, after all these unkind statements he made about me <laughs> in the Congress, uh, just before he left Washington, he called me down to the White House. I didn't know why. And he spent about an hour reminiscing about things that we had uh, argued about and problems we had. He couldn't quite come to saying he was sorry, <laughs> but he was certainly friendly and I admired him as a technician and 
certainly uh, he was a dedicated, patriotic American. Well, as you know, he had unkind things to say about almost everybody in <laughs> private. You always figured right. that. Now, you were a bit of a rebel when you were in the House. You, uh, you were the man that uh, there were young bucks there that, uh, uh, that put you in charge and threw Charlie Halleck, the minority leader, out. Why? Well, after the Goldwater debacle 64. in 1964, the Republicans lost 45 House seats. We went from 187 down to 140. And the younger members on the Republican side said, we have to make a change in our leadership. Charlie Halleck was a fine person but he represented the old guard. He was known as the gut fighter, I remember. He was a hard-nosed <laughs> gut fighter. But right. the Man. younger members who survived the Goldwater debacle said, we need new leadership. So uh, they picked me to be their candidate, and I won by the landslide margin of, uh, I think it was 83 to 77. <laughs> That's all you need. Or 73 to 67, <laughs> whatever. I see. Now, we have the, the rise of, of Richard Nixon, your friend, and right. finally in the White House, and then the advent of Watergate. Did you see at the start of that what might transpire, the very fact that Nixon might be trapped in this and be uh, forced out of the White House? I uh, was dumbfounded by the stupidity of the Watergate break-in. And on the Monday following that break-in, I think it was Saturday night, I had a meeting with John Mitchell, who was then in charge of Nixon's campaign. He initially had been Nixon's attorney general, but he resigned to run Nixon's campaign in 1972. Well, uh, I said to John Mitchell, did the president did the White House, did you know anything about this stupid break-in? And John Mitchell looked me right in the eye and said, absolutely not. So on that assurance from a former attorney general, I took the firm stand that it was not a White House uh, mm. conceived or executed operation. It, of course, as it turned out, when the tapes uh, were yeah. revealed, uh, Nixon had some knowledge, and he certainly, uh, by his uh, comments and actions, uh, participated in the obstruction mm. of justice. You stayed pretty loyal to him, and somebody at that, in that time, as I remember, quoted you as saying, uh, "You don't, uh, you don't tackle your quarterback, or you don't get rid of him. You, you, you stayed pretty close to the end." Well. After all, I was vice president. Yeah. Based on his nomination, I was assured by him, as well as by John yeah. Mitchell, yeah. that he, Nixon, had no involvement. Mm -hmm. So uh, I felt I was being told the truth. Mm -hmm. And it was a very narrow path, Hugh, for nine months. If I was critical of Nixon, the press and the public would have said, well, he's trying to undercut Nixon so he'll get the job. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I stayed too loyal, it might appear that I was supporting somebody who was involved in this very unwise action. So I had to go down this narrow path of not supporting him too much or not criticizing him too frequently. It was not a pleasant experience. When did you get the first whiff that Spiro Agnew was in trouble? Well, uh, that's an interesting story. About two days, maybe one day before the story broke, Nixon invited me to come down to his executive office in the old executive office building. I had no reason to know why I was being called you were, my, you were minority leader. I was minority leader. Yeah. He asked me to come down there, and for an hour and a half, we sat there and talked very informally, reminisced about our long friendship, 
uh, we, it was a strange conversation. I finally got a call to come to the floor of the house. Immediately, there was a vote, so I left. I got on the floor and two or three of my colleagues on the Republican side grabbed me and said, Agnew's resigning, Agnew's resigning. That was the first real knowledge I had that he had taken that action. But now, you, was there, wasn't there a little clue there that you might be in line here, at least to be investigated as a possibility? For well, that president? meeting that I just <laughs> described must have been yeah. uh, a that was the planned interview. affair yeah. by Nixon. He mm -hmm. wanted to uh, take a look at me, wanted to talk to me about policy and so forth. But I, but you must have had a clue that perhaps you were in line. Well, at least to be one, uh, one to night, be considered. Yes. That night, I was home with Betty, mm -hmm. and about 8:30 after dinner, I got a call from Mel Laird, and Mel Laird said, "I'm down at the White House. Um, would you accept the nomination for vice president if, if it was offered?" I said, "I." Yes, I would. <laughs> Did you have any doubts, though? Oh, no, no. no. If, uh, I knew if I was offered it, I would uh, accept it, but... Why? Uh, With all the stories about how worthless the job was and Lyndon Johnson was so unhappy in it and all Well, that's that. interesting because yeah. after five times trying to be speaker... I see. I had never gotten enough Republican members to become speaker. Mm -hmm. So Betty and I, in January of 1973 had decided I'd run for the House one more time and then retire. That would have filled out 28 years. So going to the vice presidency for two more years would have fulfilled 28 years and would have given me a little prestige uh, as a retiring vice president. I never be, uh, thought being vice president would lead to being president. I see. You were, however, uh, plowing new ground here. You were, you were, you were, still are the only vice president to be appointed midterm by a president under the. I was new the law. first one first under one. the Twenty Fifth yes. Amendment, but I later appointed Nelson, Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller, that's right. Uh, yeah. So he was the second. Mm -hmm. Public. What was good about being vice president as you look back? It was, uh, to a degree, uh, a training ground for president, although having been the Republican leader for 10 years, or nine and a half years, I had good exposure to presidents, to presidential problems. so. The combination of minority leader and vice president made me highly qualified to assume the presidency when Nixon resigned. Just after you became vice president, Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor, was fired. Watergate became very heated. There was impeachment talk of Richard Nixon. It looked like you were really in the fire. Uh, how did you feel about those days? It was very, very uncomfortable. I disagreed uh, privately with some of the actions that were taken by the Nixon White House. I never had good relations with Haldick, Halderman and Ehrlichman and Chuck Colson. My personality, my background didn't fit with them. So I felt that President Nixon was getting some bad advice and therefore I was very uncomfortable. Say, so did you have an inkling at the start that this thing might go the full distance and Nixon be forced out and you be president? When did that thought first occur to you? Well, number one, I hoped it would not take place because President Nixon was a longtime friend of mine. I had great respect for him. I had been assured he wasn't involved in the Watergate by him as well as by John Mitchell. So. I never expected it to happen. And there, even then, even with the storm brewing uh, there? Well, as things unraveled, it 
became more and more possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still relied on the assurances given me, and I continued to hope that President Nixon's decisions would be the ones that I knew he had made over the years and were good and would not be involved in the advice that he got from people like Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Chuck Colson. Yeah. Then you got that uh, fateful call from Al Haig that told you there was what we call a smoking gun. There was evidence that Nixon was involved. That uh, was a call that uh, Al Haig made asking to come over and see me to tell me, I think this was on a Friday afternoon, that uh, there would be a new tape released on a Monday, and he said the evidence in there was devastating and that uh, there would probably be either an impeachment or a resignation. And he laid out five or six of the options that he said might take place. And he said, I'm just warning you that you've got to be prepared that things might change dramatically and you could become president. Did this bother you? I mean, what did you think inside? Well, I was shocked and saddened yeah. because uh, I had hoped that kind of development would not take place. Mm -hmm. But according to Al Haig, in his description of the evidence that was coming on that tape, it was perfectly clear to me that Nixon uh, either was going to face impeachment in the House and probably conviction in the Senate, or he would be forced to resign. So therefore, you faced the prospect right then that you would be President of the United States, the right. possibility. That's an yeah. interesting story. Uh, Betty had uh, planned to go to New York on the following Monday to pick out some new interior things for the vice president's residence, which we were to take over from the Navy. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came home that Friday, she was making plans to go to New York on Monday, and I said, Betty, I think you better change your plans because the odds, overwhelmingly, are such I don't think we're ever going to live in the vice president's house. So she had to make up some story that things had changed and she couldn't go. But um, that was a dramatic night in our lives because for the first time we literally talked about what a significant change it would be in our lives to go from living out there in uh, the house in Alexandria to living in the White House. But you weren't afraid of the presidency? Not in any way whatsoever. You, I figured my 25 and a half years in the House, the committees I served on, which gave me the highest access to foreign policy and defense decisions, my nine and a half years as Republican leader where I was involved in White House meetings over the years gave me unquestioned preparation to become president without any problems. But a lot of people suggest you were dealt a pretty tough hand. Scandal, the Watergate, of course, the end of Vietnam, you could see the collapse coming, inflation, recession, that's a pretty tough time. We had a full platter on my desk in the Oval Office. You're right. We had Watergate. We had the serious problems of what was happening in Vietnam. Uh, we inherited the worst economic recession in post-war period. Inflation was high, interest rates were high, unemployment was growing. Uh, we had a prospective uh, uh, meeting with Mr. Brezhnev in Vladivostok to negotiate uh, arms reduction in the nuclear area. Uh, we had not only domestic problems, which were very serious, but we had challenges uh, from abroad. Our allies weren't sure 
what a new president would do Who's under Jerry these Ford? circumstances. <laughs> and uh, we were apprehensive that maybe our enemies, our adversaries, would try to take advantage of this change in uh, U.S. leadership. Back up just a bit here and tell me about August 9th. You have to, you're told you're going to be president, you have to go, uh, that Nixon's going to resign, you have to go see him and escort him out of the White House. What'd you think? That was pretty sad, uh, Hugh, very sad because of our long personal friendship mm -hmm. with Dick and Pat, but... Uh, what do you tell them? We went down to the White House and uh, tried to be cordial, but what can you say in that kind of a circumstance except to thank them for their service to the country over a long period of time and wish them well? It was a difficult 25 or 30 minutes that we had in the White House and walking out to the helicopter. Uh, that's a sad <laughs> situation when you see uh, a couple that have been good friends going and uh, leaving under those very tragic circumstances. What's the first thing you did when you turned away and went back into the White House? Your White House now. I squeezed my wife's hand and said, we'll do our best. Where'd you go? Did you go to the office? Well, I think we went up to the Oval Office, as I recall. Our uh, children were there, and I had, of course, almost immediately the responsibility of going into the East Room, I'm sure you remember that, where I had to be sworn in, mm -hmm. and where I had to make an acceptance speech. And um, I couldn't prepare my speech until 24 hours or less beforehand, mm -hmm. because up until the last minute, Hugh, we weren't sure what President Nixon was going to do. And I had a wonderful speechwriter, Bob Hartman, who went home the night before and stayed up till three or four o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and wrote this speech, and he came in to see me at eight o'clock in my office uh, as vice president, and he handed me the copy and I read it. He had a knack of saying what I would say. And I came to one sentence, and I said, Bob, we ought to strike this. And it was the sentence, our long national nightmare is over. <laughs> and Bob Hartman said to me, if you strike that, I'm quitting. <laughs> <laughs> so I left it in, and it turned out to be the most memorable line in my remarks. I and see. it was a wonderful line. I see. Okay, you're president now. Uh, probably the first thing that happened, or big thing that happened, was the, the pardon, the Nixon pardon. Describe that to me a little bit, because here is a country that's really crying for retribution against a president that they feel has violated the trust. You're in the spot, and yet one day you decide to do that. Well, let me take just a minute to give you the background. In the first roughly 28 days I was in the White House, I spent at least 25% of my time listening to the lawyers from the White House or the lawyers from the Department of Justice taking my time on what I should do about Mr. Nixon's papers, Mr. Nixon's uh, uh, tapes. At the same time, I was struggling with serious economic problems that were plaguing the country. High inflation, high interest rates, a growing unemployment, a serious recession right over the brink. We had international problems with the Soviet Union, and our allies were apprehensive. So I had a full platter of problems involving 230 million American people. Then I went to a press conference, my first press conference, 
And I thought I would be asked questions about uh, the economy, about international affairs. 90% of those questions were from the White House press, what are you gonna do about Mr. Nixon's tapes, Mr. Nixon's papers? And as I walked back to the Oval Office, I said to myself, I gotta get rid of that problem. How can I do it as quickly as possible? I talked to Phil Buchan, my counsel, and I said, can I pardon him? And he took a day or two to look at the options, came back and said yes, and I decided that was the only way I could get rid of Mr. Nixon's problems that were taking 25% of my daily time so I could spend 100% of my time on the problems of 230 million Americans. You never felt manipulated in no, that time? No, none whatsoever. I made the sole decision, and I have to say uh, uh, most of my staff disagreed with me, but I was absolutely convinced it was the right thing to do, and I'm even more convinced today, Hugh, 20 years ago. You know, ago. you told me a story about calling up Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House, <laughs> to tell him about that. He was playing golf on the, at Burning Tree, and what did he tell you? Tell that story. Well, I can't recall the precise words, but he said it was a dumb mistake, and it would uh, hurt you, me politically. That you'd lose the election, as I remember. Right. Yeah. Uh, I said, yeah. well, Tip, uh, I'm doing what I think is right. And I felt strongly then, and I feel equally strongly today. Now, did you see Nixon at all after this? What was your relationship with him as he kind of went into seclusion? I went to California about a month after Nixon's left the White House, and as you may remember, he had a serious phlebitis problem. Mm -hmm. Was in a hospital in California, and as a matter of courtesy, I went to the hospital and saw him. He almost died on that occasion. He had all the tubes in his mouth and his nose. I never saw anybody uh, closer to death and still alive than Dick Nixon was at that time. And you went to his funeral? And, I went uh, to his funeral yeah. along with uh, others. Uh, and your feelings? A, yes, About he was a longtime friend who made a very stupid mistake. So I have to look at the overall, which I think was a good record, and uh, concede that everybody's human and you can make mistakes that are very unfortunate and yeah. regrettable. Did you feel uh, uh, at a disadvantage because you were really never elected? You weren't elected vice president and you were never elected president. Uh, did that weaken you at all? I didn't think so. After all, I got a very strong vote oh. by Democrats mm -hmm. in the House and Senate when I was nominated. It would have been helpful to have won in 1976, so any apprehension about a, an appointed person would have been wiped out. But we lost that election very close, and uh, as I recall, uh, if we'd gotten uh, 6,000 more votes in Ohio <laughs> and 2,000 more in Hawaii, we would have won. Yeah. How did you deal with the criticism when you got in the presidency? Because, as you know, any president is subject to uh, just mm -hmm. this horrendous criticism. Number one, you'd come in in this, in this unusual way. Uh, you were viewed in various critical manner. Uh, how'd you deal with it? Well, I had learned a long time ago when I competed in athletics. Sports writers are tougher than even the White House <laughs> press effort. corps. So yeah. having played football and coached football, I had developed an understanding of uh, criticism by the news media. Uh, you can't let criticism, either by the public or the news media, uh, upset you mentally or otherwise. If you are right and think you're right, uh, the criticism ought to roll off your shoulders without any uh, bother. Now, the only time I got upset 
was when there would be criticism, I thought unfairly, of our children and my wife Betty. Now that really irritated me. Didn't bother you when uh, on your golf game or uh, oh, anything no, like no, that no, that. when you hit a spectator <laughs> or something like that? I, I used to laugh at that and of course Bob Hope uh, over the years has made a, a mint of money making jokes about my golf game. He, Chevy Chase about your falling down. Yeah, Bob Hope says uh, uh, I'm the only president that uh, can play four golf courses simultaneously and <laughs> see. calls me the hitman of the PGA. <laughs> I see. We come up to Vietnam and amnesty, the partial amnesty that right. you've granted. Now again, very controversial. What do you do with those kids? Why'd you do that? Well, I felt that this whole group of our younger generation had made uh, what they thought was a conscientious decision to either refuse to serve or to uh, uh, flee to get out of uh, going in the military. And in order to heal the land, it was important. Uh, with Watergate and the war in Vietnam, our country, Hugh, was torn apart. People had lost faith in the government. They had lost faith in the White House. Uh, the American people were yelling and screaming at each other. And if I, as president, could in any way bring about a healing, I thought it was a step in the right direction. And as offering amnesty to this group, I thought was a constructive step to bring them back into being a part of our society. Uh, it was a good program. It worked. It gave those individuals uh, an opportunity to earn the right uh, having their record corrected. Now, the, the end of Vietnam came on your watch, Mr. Sure President. Did. Was there much you could do, or did you just, were you just an observer in that period? I was not an observer. I. Uh, I thought we had an obligation to do our very best to carry out the negotiated settlement that Secretary Kissinger had achieved in January of 1943, the Paris Accord. Of course, the North Vietnamese never lived up to those agreements, and uh, because our Congress refused to give adequate military aid our South Vietnamese allies had inadequate military equipment to fight the North Vietnamese, and so uh, North Vietnamese overran South Vietnam and were right on the outskirts of uh, Saigon, and that's where the crunch came. Yeah. And uh, at that point, because Congress lost its guts and wouldn't put the money up to help our allies, we were faced with a critical situation how we could evacuate all of the Americans from Saigon. And as many of our South Vietnamese friends who had fought with us and stayed with us as possible. We had some disputes, uh, Secretary Schlesinger uh, was most anxious to get all the Americans out, but he delayed uh, in some of the uh, evacuation programs about getting some of the South Vietnamese out. At the same time, I had a, an ambassador <laughs> in Saigon named Martin who wanted to stay until the last and evacuate everybody, including U.S. people, personnel, as well as South Vietnamese. So I was pulled both ways, and I felt to the very end we should uh, evacuate as many of our allied South Vietnamese as possible. And the net result was we um, did a good job. And we not only got all our Americans out, but we got a significant number of South Vietnamese who would been staunch allies during the war in Vietnam. On the Mayaguez affair, the kidnapping of those Americans, or at least the expropriating of that ship over in the South China Sea, 
that's a kind of a classic case of decision making in which there wasn't enough information and tell me a little about that how you face that well first I was awakened about 5 a.m. by Brent Scowcroft who was the head of my National Security Council and telling me that there were radio reports that an American merchant ship had been seized in international waters I called an NSC meeting I think at 8 o'clock that morning and by that time we had some official confirmation it had been seized by the Cambodians and was being taken to one of their harbors I decided we could not tolerate that obvious violation of international law so I ordered the Department of Defense to take necessary action to get more information on the first hand and to be prepared to recover the ship on the other and of course it involved sending some Marines from another base unfortunately we had a helicopter accident was mechanical not involving the enemy but anyhow we ended up with US forces seizing the ship and recovering the merchant marine sailors now it was a decision that I had to make to make sure that the world knew we weren't going to be kicked around I couldn't help but remember the tragedy of the Pueblo incident where about two years previous the North Koreans had seized an American Coast Guard ship and held it for what 18 months I was not going to let that happen in this case and so I made the decision to involve our Air Force involve our Marines and we got the ship as well as the crew back going on now you were facing Jimmy Carter in the election of 1976 what went wrong well in the first place you after our convention we were 34 points behind Jimmy Carter had a insurmountable lead and I demanded that we have debates I challenged him to debates and we had three of them the first one on domestic policy I think I did well I was not expected to second on national security foreign policy and military I said something about Poland in retrospect I was a hundred percent right but it just time, a little ahead of your time right? yeah <laughs> and the last one in Williamsburg was about everything I think we ran a good campaign because when we ended up on the election day we lost by one percentage point was it a case of just being burdened with too much the scandal and of all the things that preceded you I think you're right you know, there there were some who never forgave the Republicans for the war in Vietnam even though President John F Kennedy had made the first combat commitment in Vietnam there were people that never forgave me for pardoning Richard Nixon there were people who didn't think our economic recovery was coming along quickly enough but when you lose by about 10,000 votes 6,000 in Ohio and two or three thousand in Hawaii the election could have changed very dramatically with a minor shift in how the voters how'd you feel how'd you cope with that sense of loss well I never like to lose anything I'm a competitive person but on the other hand again if I could reflect on athletics I played on winning teams and losing teams and when we lost a game I never sat around and groused about it I always thought there was another game the next week and you ought to start preparing for the next ball game and in politics I lost the presidential election but I had to start thinking about a new life what I was going to do what Betty and I and the family 
would have for our future. That's a much better attitude to have than to sit around and moan and groan about taking a beating. We did the best we could and darn near won against tough odds. Mr. President, let's go back a little to your, your boyhood uh, and your family and that. What uh, really helped you in later life or being president? Uh, family values, Boy Scouts, football, war, Yale, maybe a little of all of those. Well, Hugh, I was very, very lucky. I had a wonderful mother and I was equally blessed to have a superb stepfather. My mother divorced my real father when I was less than a year old. And when I was about a month old, she took me because my real father was abusing her physically and mentally and took me by train from Omaha, where I was born, to Grand Rapids, where her friend, her parents were. So I never knew that I was a, an adopted son until I was about 15. My stepfather was a magnificent person and my mother equally wonderful. So I was brought up in a very wonderful environment. I had three younger brothers of my mother's second marriage. Actually, my stepfather probably treated me as well, if not better, than his own children. So I couldn't have written a better prescription for a superb family upbringing. Mm -hmm. You were an excellent football player. You got scholarships, of course, for it. Why didn't you become a professional? Well, I, uh, in high school, was All-State. I was captain of the All-State team. I went to the University of Michigan. In those days, you didn't have a scholarship. But our head football coach got me a job <laughs> over at the university hospital where I waited on table for the interns and cleaned up the uh, meals in the nurse's cafeteria, for which I got paid 50 cents an hour and I worked four hours a day and with $2 in 1931, I could buy all the food I needed. And I rented a room for $4 a week. And I had earned that money uh, in my stepfather's paint company. Uh, we got no scholarship. About every three months, I'd go over at the university hospital and give blood for which I was paid $25 oh, for goodness. whatever, a quart or whatever. That cash came in very handy. So uh, then I uh, played at University of Michigan and I played in the Shrine East-West game in San Francisco after I graduated in the All-Star game against the Chicago Bears in uh, Chicago. And then I got a job coaching football at Yale as an assistant, and my pay was $2,400 a year, but single during the Depression, that was, that was adequate. Eventually, I worked up to earning $3,600 a year and going to law school simultaneously. So I had a full schedule of trying to be a coach where I was earning $3,600 a year and going to one of the best, if not the best, law school full time. What did the war do to you? It was a great experience. I graduated from law school, went back to Grand Rapids to practice law, and had opened up uh, our law firm of Ford and Buchan without a client. And uh, a year later, the war came. I was single. And so I joined the Navy. I was very lucky again. I spent nine months in the Naval Air Training Command in North Carolina and I got bored and I applied for sea duty. And I was assigned to a, an aircraft carrier, which was a great assignment. And we went out to the Pacific and I spent two and a half years in the Pacific War on a ship that was involved in all of 
Admiral Halsey and Admiral Mishner's uh, island hopping operations. It gave me a realization that you had to make a commitment to your country in a crisis. Uh, I had never thought much about going into the military as I grew up, but when Pearl Harbor happened, it made a difference. People were eager and anxious to get in whatever service they were uh, involved in. I enjoyed the Navy, it was good training. I was in the middle of combat for two years. Uh, I had good captains. I was the assistant navigator uh, and I was the uh, officer of the deck during combat. So uh, I had great experience. What, back to the presidency now, what do you think is your greatest achievement as president? I hope historians a few years from now will write that the Ford administration healed the land, that President Ford uh, restored public confidence in the White House and in the government. What was your greatest disappointment? My greatest disappointment was that I couldn't turn a switch and all of a sudden overnight go from an economic recession to economic prosperity. That was the greatest disappointment domestically. The greatest disappointment internationally was that I was not elected so I could have consummated a nuclear weapons arms reduction with Mr. Brezhnev so that we could have significantly reduced the nuclear threshold in the Cold War. There were two attempts, quote unquote, on your life while you were president. One, an actual shot. Another one, apparently, uh, an, a, there would have been a shot had they not discovered uh, the woman with the gun. Uh, what did that do to you as a leader? Did that change your feeling about the presidency? Or? Well, the first one was in Sacramento when uh, Squeaky Fromm, a member of the Manson gang, uh, stuck her hand toward me as though she was going to shake hands and it ended up she had a gun in her hand. So her gun was about this far from my face when the Secret Service agent Larry Boondorf saw it and grabbed the gun and prevented her from pulling the trigger. That was pretty close. Mm -hmm. The second one was about a month later in San Francisco when Sarah Jane Moore, as I came out of the St. Francis Hotel, took a shot at me from across the street and she lost her aim because a Marine standing next to her saw her and hit her hand and the shot missed me by three or four feet. Uh, those were scary. Mm -hmm. How do you live with that? Well, once it's over, you, you say, well, it's nothing happened, so forget it, and you just have to uh, say that's one of the perils of the profession. Mm -hmm. What about being president just generally? What would you change in the office? Is it, is it satisfactory the way it's set up? A person who's qualified, who has the right character and the right motives can handle the job. We don't need to change the duties and responsibilities. We have to make sure the person the American people elect has the qualifications that are essential for the circumstances that are presented to him as our chief executive. Mr. President, on Bicentennial Day in 1976, July 4th, you toured from Washington up to Philadelphia. I don't know that I've ever seen a more joyous sort of emotional event. Tell me about that a little bit. Well, that was a busy, busy day. We went up to uh, where Washington crossed the Delaware. We went to Philadelphia. And I made a speech in that historic building. Then we flew to New York where they had the tall ships in the New York Harbor. 
It was a very emotional day and ended up on the balcony at the White House with one of those magnificent fireworks displays. One couldn't help but have joy and pride on the 200th anniversary of this great country. You never thought a boy from Grand Rapids would uh, travel that route, huh? I uh, looked back and wondered how it ever happened to me, and I uh, think it's a great country that something like that could happen to somebody with that background. And as we look at the lives of later presidents, many of them came from humble uh, backgrounds from Plains, Georgia, and Hope, Arkansas. You're still rather upbeat about the, about the office and its ability to cope you, with the problems. I get very irritated with people who make a profession about bashing America. I detest the cynics, the skeptics. In my lifetime, our country's got a pretty good track record. We overcame the depression of the 1930s, which was a terrible tragedy. We overcame the challenge of uh, Hitler and our other adversaries in World War II and beat back aggression and aggression in World War I. We have overcome since the end of World War II five recessions. We ended up a few years ago winning the battle against communism and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact nation. That's a good track record. And we ought to be proud of it instead of being cynical and skeptical. America's a great country.